Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of the To Find a Home series. This fic is entitled To Rescue You. The assurance that they wanted to adopt him could only assuage Izuku's fear of abandonment so much. He was still waiting for the other shoe to drop, but both men remained just as calm, welcoming, and loving. He wasn't really sure about that last one, since he had no memory of being loved, but he thinks it might feel something like this. Slowly, he started dropping his guard more and more, testing boundaries, seeing how far he could go before they realized they were making a mistake. He started by asking for seconds at dinner. Yamada actually beamed at him, and was so excited about it that he ended up serving him way more than Izuka could stomach. He still didn't get angry at him, though, waving him off, saying it was his fault he'd just gotten over-eager, and that the leftovers would be waiting for him in the fridge when he got hungry later. Later, he went to the fridge and ate some more, side-eyeing both heroes discreetly. Neither said anything, or paid attention to him, eyes remaining on the TV screen. He knew better than to think that they didn't know what he was doing, though. They were pro-heroes, and he purposefully made enough noise that they would know he was there. His heart was beating rapidly, but everything he'd tested that day had turned out well, so in a surge of confidence he decided to sit with them in the living room and watch the news report alongside them. He still sat the farthest away, that he could, and on the very edge of the seat, ready to bolt. He was incredibly tense, no matter how often he tried reminding himself to act casually. Eventually, he managed to calm himself down some, and even sat further into the couch. He was still only able to stay there for a few minutes before he ended up retreating into the, his room, wishing them a good night as he left, very shaky. He felt like he just fought a villain, and barely escaped with his life, with the adrenaline running through his veins and the erratic beating of his heart. But he did so much today and they didn't get angry or upset or glare or scream at him. If anything, they smiled encouragingly. He doesn't cry because he'd done enough of that the night before that they had said they wanted to adopt him, but he feels the emotion rising in him all the same. After the kid leaves the room, Hisashi sends a bright, excited grin at his husband, cheering quietly enough that Izuku couldn't hear, but that it could convey his elation all the same. He's pretty much bouncing in his seat in excitement, and Shota can't help his eye roll, but he himself is sporting a similar smile to the one that he had already had the day that they had gotten married. He's just as excited. Eventually, Hisashi can't keep his energy contained while seated any longer, so he gets up and starts jumping as much as he can, without his feet leaving the floor, so as not to make any noise that could worry the kid. It makes his husband snort, but quickly enough, he's also standing as well, and embracing his overexcited partner before lifting him off the floor and twirling him around. At that point, normally, Hisashi would be shrieking in delight, but he has to exert constraint so that he keeps any noise to himself and kisses his husband instead. They remain like that, tangled with one another, swaying slightly like they're dancing to a song that only they can hear, bathing in the light-hearted feeling that had taken a hold of their hearts. Do you think that that's how parents feel when their child comes into the world? Hisashi asks while he rests his forehead against Shoda's, close as can be. The man hums an answer. I think so. There's a brightness to his eyes, a happiness that doesn't often shine through. Guess we're really dads now, huh? Hisashi can't believe he has to be the one keeping his husband in check and be all logical about this, but he has to bring them back down to earth before they start getting ahead of themselves. Takes him a few seconds to take a deep breath in and calm down his racing heart before he rests his head on Shota's shoulder. There's a long way to go before he can feel completely safe with us still. We might be dads as far as we're concerned, but... Probably not to him yet. It's too soon, even if he's trying his best. I know, Shota answers, pressing a kiss to the silky blonde hair of the man he loves. I know. Final exams come and go. They celebrate Izuku's success that night, with Izuku's favorite dish whose name they managed to get out of him. Some teachers, All Might, wanted to pair Bakugo and Midoriya together. Both Nezu and Eraser had shut that down. Hard. Although they'd managed to get Bakugo into anger management classes and therapy, with the threat of expulsion over him. In case he perpetuated quirk discrimination and bullying, that did not mean he'd become more open-minded. Had he been behaving lately? Yes. Did he still set off explosions in the palm of his hands while glaring at Insuku to intimidate him? Also yes. They weren't putting one child into danger to teach another a lesson. No. Instead, Bakugo would be paired up with Todoroki. Both needed to learn teamwork, and that firepower alone couldn't win all fights. 
Izuku was paired with Shoji against Snipe instead, with the goal of finding out how to win against a long-ranged opponent when they themselves needed to get close in to get a hit. Sure, Midoriya could have just pulled out his gun and shot Snipe, but for that he would need to have an open window, and if he had one, then he would also be allowing that to his teacher, and out of the two of them, one was both faster and a better shot. Furthermore here, Snipe was the villain, and they were heroes. He would be able to shoot either of them in the chest immediately, while they couldn't exactly justify the use of lethal force. It didn't end up being that difficult of a fight for the boys regardless, with them taking turns distracting their teacher until Izuku secretly passed Shoji a smoke bomb, limiting Snipe's sight. Purposely making himself be heard behind the hero, Izuku dropped to the ground to avoid the bullet being shot his way, while Shoji wrangled their teacher, who now had his back to him, to the ground and into handcuffs. The buzzer sounded and they high-fived. Did they cut it short with the timer? Maybe, but everything had been taken into account and the plan had worked out. In the end, even the ones who'd failed the practical got to go to the summer camp, which Izuku was feeling a little disappointed since that meant that Bakuga would be there as well. At least that meant Todoroki, Seito, Kirishima, Kaminari, and Ashido would be there too. He was only kind of close to Todoroki as they both were clearly traumatized and emotionally withdrawn, so neither minded the silence of their companionship. There was even some sort of understanding where Todoroki would drop the temperature around anyone who looked down on Izuku for being quirkless. Neither mentioned it. And if people who accused Todoroki of getting to where he was thanks to his father, if they couldn't find their umbrellas on rainy days, it was a coincidence, truly. He didn't know how he ended up at the mall with the rest of the class when he hated this place himself. Maybe it had been the casual mention of it that Aizawa had done after overhearing his students' plan, asking if Izuku wanted to go. He did, but he also did not. He could tell both of his guardians were hoping he would go, and if before he would interpret that to mean that they wanted him out of their way, he now knew they just were wishing that he would make more friends. He'd agreed before he even knew it, and that's how he'd ended up here that day, being hushed out of the door with more money in his hands than he'd ever held, and even though his guardians had already gotten him everything on the list of necessities for camp. Well, worst case scenario, he'd just binge on sweets and leave early. He realizes that he'd been too unrealistic when he imagined the worst-case scenario. No, finding himself alone in a crowd of civilians with the hand of a villain with a five-point contact disintegration quirk around his neck was the worst-case scenario. Somehow, the first thing he thought about was Aizawa and Yamada. How he doesn't want to leave them. How he wishes they'd come and save him. That was ridiculous. No one had ever come and saved him. Except them, he now realized. They'd saved him in a way that he didn't realize he needed to be. All this time, he wanted to be a hero so his life would have some worth. So that he could die saving someone. So that his life had meaning. So there could be a reason that lives could remain when his would end. But he didn't want to die right then. He wanted to go home and have Hisashi excitedly ask him about his trip and what he'd done. He wanted Shota to discreetly check him over to make sure he was fine. He wanted second servings and Katsudan and cake when he did well at something. He wanted to live. He doesn't really know what happens after. He knows the crazy motherfucker monologues. He knows that he responds. He knows that Uraraka spots him, and he knows that she realizes what's going on and calls Sensei. He knows all of that, but he's not processing anything, until he sees a black jumpsuit in the corner of his eyes, and he dizzily is standing up and barreling into Aizawa's chest. Only then does he calm down. Only then does he come back to himself and is able to give his testimony and reassure his classmates that had been surrounding him, both protecting him from the crowd and making sure he was all right. If they find it strange how he's glued to their teacher's side, they don't mention it. When they go home, Hisashi is standing in front of the door, hair in disarray like he'd run his hands through it too many times, and Izuku smothered in a hug before he even passed the threshold. After a few seconds, he's pushed back so the man can survey and assess him for injuries although he surely knows that his husband would have had him treated before bringing him back anyways. When he passes the inspection, he's being crushed again into his chest, and he finds himself not minding. He isn't constricted. He feels safe. He feels loved. And he's glad he got to come back. He'd already soaked in all the warmth and affection Hisashi showered him in with right away before they had to leave, and yet it was still not enough when he made his way to the camp fighting through a forest literally coming alive to hinder them. Did it make him a bad person if seeing somebody else cry made him happy? Maybe he was. He wouldn't tell them, though. The summer camp was hell, Izuku thought. Every cell in his body burnt, and he wasn't just talking about his muscles. No, 
Every single part of his body hurt. Every cell from the smallest hair on top of his head to the tip of his toes. Everything hurt, and he had never been as aware of his body as he was right now at this moment. He almost wishes Yamada was there to restrain aizawa some, but he wasn't sure if it wouldn't make the situation worse. The others spent hours overworking their quirks, so what did he do? Everything else. Mainly he worked out and fought against all of his teammates, one by one, as well as against the heroes. He would take on ten students a day, as well as a pro hero, for two weeks. Hooray. But he also had stealth, reconnaissance, infiltration, espionage, and strategic planning training as well. He might not become a powerhouse, but he was going to be proficient in everything an underground hero was susceptible to need. His gun training included a certain amount of targets he needed to find and shoot within a certain area and a limited time frame, while still avoiding projectiles from time to time as well, of course. Some were well hidden and almost impossible to spot, but he had to regardless. Doing 50 push-ups, squats, or sit-ups for each failure was enough incentive for him to do well, even if he was going to try regardless. Training with the capture weapon was unexpectedly, the best part of the training. But at best did not mean it was good, but he would take what he could. However, after spending the day overworking his body so much, he barely had the arm strength necessary to swing around, let alone make the minute movements that he needed to control the weapon. Regardless, at the end of the day, he was unmoving and silent as all his classmates were, except soft moans of pain and loud complaints against the cruelty of their teacher. In a surge of pettiness, he almost wanted to lay out all of the man's shameful secrets, tell him about his favorite Barbie pink jogger, how he cried in front of soap operas when one of the characters passed away, or how he face-planted onto the floor upon coming back from a tough patrol. He even had pictures. He didn't understand why the man let him take them, let alone keep them. He would never betray him like that, yet, yet the simple thought of it made him feel better somehow. He could get revenge. He wouldn't. But he was choosing not to. Ha! Who had the power now? It was still Aizawa, but, well, he didn't know why he ended up taking a plate of curry to the six-year-old that he didn't really care about, but somewhere deep down under all the bitterness and the discrimination and cruelty they could show, he still wanted kids to be safe and happy, and this one was not. Upon learning of his parents' fate, he almost wanted to tell the kid, tough luck, at least your parents loved you, but it wasn't the traumatized kid's grand prize award, so he settled for... I don't really care about your parents. I just want you to eat. So eat. Straightforward, and to the point. Not a request, but an order. Was it what he should have said? Probably not. It went against everything heroes are supposed to be, but the boy didn't want nor need compassion, and Azuka was the last person he would get it from anyway. Huh? Aren't you supposed to be a hero? Is that really how you're supposed to talk to people? Do you want me to act like a hero? Because I thought you said they were stupid. Winning an argument against a six-year-old was nothing impressive, but he would take the wins where he could get them. He stared at the kid until he felt pressured enough that he grabbed the plate and started eating, and then he nodded and left. They were similar in the end. They both lost their parents at a young age, but in different ways. Koda came to hate heroes. Izuku came to hate himself. Koda's was way healthier. When the kid came back to the camp, he stared at Izuku longer than he did the others before clicking his tongue and sullenly walking into the lodge. The students also eventually go inside to take advantage of the hot baths that would soothe their muscles. They would need it, as the next day would be noticeably worse, and sadly, not just because of their soreness. It started out like the previous day. They were just as tired, but somehow some of them managed to find the energy to hold a test of courage in the evening. Izuku wanted to just go back inside and sleep, but apparently that wasn't allowed, as this was part of the required activities of the training camp. Why? He could tell Bakuga wanted to go even if he acted like he didn't care, and he went with the rest of the students having to take additional classes for failing the practical. That cheered him up a little. So what if he found happiness amidst the pettiness? It was valid. Going last by himself was fine by him, although he didn't promise that he wouldn't kick some one B kid in the face if they jumped him. He felt like this was a good test of how much his perception of his surroundings had improved since the camp started. Hopefully some change would be noticeable already, but... It's after the fifth pair that Uraraka and Suyu leave that things start to go shit. Smoke is visible from deep within the forest, and Izuku's growing suspicion is confirmed when he sees the first few villains. He hears the order for him to retreat back to the lodge with the others, but... Koda, he whispers, worried. It doesn't take him more than a couple of seconds to make his decision. I'm going to find Koda. I know where he is. I'll bring him back. He's off before he can hear any answer. There's no time for arguing. 
The branches hit his arms and face. He trips on some roots, and it doesn't matter. He just goes as fast as his body allows him to, after the past two days. He can only feel relief for a second, at the sight of Coda before his eyes catch on to another figure. Dark clothes, a mountain of muscles, a bionic eye. Muscular. The man who murdered the Waterhouse duo and Coda's parents. Now, Izuku might be training to be a hero, but he's not delusional. Sure, no hero is a one-trick pony or whatever bullshit Eraserhead likes spouting, but you didn't need to be a genius to figure out the outcome of a match between a snowball and a flamethrower. Unfortunately, in this situation, he's the snowball. But he still has to be a hero because he's not alone, and there's a child right there with him, and what kind of person would he be if he just turned tail and ran? Actually, the thought doesn't even cross his mind. He just stays there, staring in horror as part of his soul accepts death already. There are unwinnable fights, and this is one of those. Doesn't mean he isn't going down swinging, though. He races for Coda, and Muscular doesn't even bother stopping him. He's there to play. A six-year-old and a quirkless teenager. Not much fun for a man who routinely killed heroes and civilians alike. He'd have to make it last. Hiding Coda behind him, Izuku whispers as he crouches down and reaches for his shoes. When I move, run back and run through the forest. Back to the camp, all right? I'll stall for time. Can you do me a favor, though? When you make it, send someone my way. I wouldn't mind the help. But... Coda. Izuku cuts him off, and he turns his head just slightly to the side so he can look at the child without losing sight of the villain. It's going to be okay. Can you be brave for me, please? It's spoken softly, entirely unlike the situation full of fear and tension, and Izuku's smile is small but confident. His eyes don't waver. When he says things are going to be okay, it doesn't sound empty. It sounds like a fact. Not a wish. Not a reassurance. A fact. And despite his parents' murderer standing only a few feet away from them, Coda believes him. Words that would have had no meaning to him normally just reassured him and gave him complete faith in the boy that he only met a couple of days ago, and he never really talked to. He nods determinedly, and Izuku flashes him a thankful smile before he turns back toward Muscular. Finally! Here I was starting to think that you were about to set down a table and pull out some tea. I think I gave you enough time, didn't I? Now... Izuku doesn't let him finish and just rushes the villain with a shout of Go! to the child behind him. Muscular smiles at him in glee and readies his arm for a strike. Izuku does his best to hide what he's holding from the criminal. It was pretty clear from the first day of school that Aizawa knew about the knives he carried around. They didn't ask him to completely give them up, but he was still told that he couldn't have more than three, nobody could see them, and if he used them, he was out. That was good enough for him. He only kept them to protect himself, both on the streets and at school in case of quirk extremists, where expulsion was better than death if it came down to it. Even now at the training camp, he couldn't stop the habit of always having something to defend himself with. As a quirkless person, his chances of being attacked for his quirk status alone were too high risk to be unarmed, and worse still with the possibility of a villain attack. Not that he was really thinking that one would happen, or he would have taken more than two tiny blades in his shoes and a regular-sized one in the waistband of his shorts. Honestly, he didn't have a chance. Two quirked pro-heroes didn't die to this man, so one quirkless hero student armed with three knives and some spite could take him down. Still, he had to gain some time, because if he was going to die... Sorry, Yamada. Sorry, Aizawa. Sorry. He w at least wasn't bringing anyone else down with him. The backup wouldn't make it on time. He wasn't even sure Coda would make it to camp fast enough not to be caught up by Muscular before he could. He was still going to try, and right now, what he had going for him were three things. Underestimation, ignorance, and the element of surprise. Not nearly enough to win, but enough to try, at least. His plan was this. Use his two small knives to scale up Muscular's body until he made it to his head before stabbing him in his remaining eye with his regular-sized blade. Yeah, that plan had about a 0.5% odd of succeeding, but that was all he had, honestly. As it was, maybe 0.5% was being a little optimistic since when he arrived in front of Muscular, he was only as tall as the man's knee, fuck, and ducked from the man's right hook. He tried to stab him with one knife, only for it to fail. No, it didn't scratch, it didn't pierce him. He wasn't sure it even was felt, because the blade broke right as he tried stabbing his thigh. Izuku froze, and everything was silent. That was... He was staring at his knife's handle that was left in his hands in bewilderment with the deepest sense of betrayal. He didn't expect to win. He didn't even expect to get far. He still expected to deal some damage. Instead, Muscular was looking down at him like one would a child, and the tiny blade, no longer a blade, just a handle, 
in his hand held out in front of his dumbstruck face. A blade of grass in front of a giant. The man couldn't even hold it in. He clutched his side and laughed and laughed and laughed so hard he went to his knees and tears started gathering in his one functional eye. Izuku just stared in horror at what remained of his knife, at muscular he didn't dare turn around in case he was met with the sight of Kota's defeated face. Three knives and spite. Now, two knives and even spite was being drowned under waves of horror at how utterly fucked he was, at how dead he was going to be, at how pathetic it was going to be, at how painful it would be. This couldn't even count as going down fighting. It was like he just punched a wall and broke in his own hand instead of doing any damage. It was... His head was empty. He let go of the useless handle in his left hand and gripped tighter to the remaining one in his right. The villain was still laughing, down on his knees, crying from Izuku's sheer patheticness. He opened his eye only to double back down upon seeing the boy's horrified face. There was not a single thought in Izuku's head. Only a knife in hand, a man on his knees in front of him who would kill him the moment he got a hold of himself again. Or maybe he'd let Izuku go for the laugh that he got out of him. Ha! <laughs> As if. He moved as if in slow motion. Right hand, knife, right eye. It went in surprisingly easy. He'd always known to go for the eyes, because no matter who or whatever mutation they had, the eyes always remained a weak spot. The best shot at winning. The best shot at surviving. He'd barely even had to raise his arm. That was how perfectly the height had worked for him to stab the man with. Winning by patheticness? He'd take pathetic over dead any day. He might have taken the villain's eyesight, but it didn't keep him from feeling the pain, and Izuku had been so out of it that he didn't even think to step back after stabbing, so he went straight into the line of fire when Muscular blindly batted his arm through the air. He received the full force blow, and it took all the air out of his lungs. He flew into the forest, crashing into trees which broke underneath the power his body was smashed with. That was it. One blow and he was out. He could tell he had multiple ribs broken, all caved painfully in words, and his dinner had left his body somewhere between where he had been and where he landed. He tried getting up. His legs were fine. His arms were fine. His head was painful, dizzy, but it was fine. He only had a few broken ribs. It wasn't a big deal. In books, characters always got back up after being stabbed or shot, and they walked off broken legs. But for him, a single twitch of his body as he tried to get up sent out such pain through him that it had him gasping. A terrible idea where your ribs were, or were most, like poking out through your lungs, made him gasp once more, and he had to hold his breath so it wouldn't become an unending cycle of gasping and worsening his injuries. He breathed in slowly, breathed out slower still, needles piercing his chest all the while. If Muscular came after him right now, he would be able to do no more than watch him. Thankfully, he could hear him cursing and yelling into empty air from where they'd initially been standing, quite far away, and without eyesight he wouldn't be able to find Izuku easy. He didn't know how long he had passed already, or how much longer he, it would take for someone to find him, but if it wasn't fast, he wouldn't make it. He heard the message allowing him to use his non-existent quirk and his lips quirked up at the irony. That wouldn't have helped him any. Soon enough he heard muscular yelp and the sound of what could only be a bone breaking, a grunt, and then silence. He couldn't hear anything for a few seconds until he heard a cry in the distance. Izuku! His smile grew. His dad, no, Aizawa was here. He couldn't call out, couldn't even breathe too deeply still, but he was pretty sure the path his body had made through the trees would soon lead his father, no, teacher, to his location. He could feel black spots darkening his vision, but he held on. His injuries were bad. Very bad. Bad enough that he might not wake up once he lost consciousness. He didn't want his last memory to be stabbing into a man's skull or a muscular's ugly face. He wanted to see his dad. It felt like forever and barely a second at the same time, before the call of his name was close enough that he knew Aizawa could see him. He heard the leaves crunch underneath the man's feet. He was always so silent, even during the training that his steps never made a sound, never betrayed his location before he saw his face above him. It was horror-stricken, and if Izuku didn't know his state was bad then, he would have now. Hey, kiddo, his teacher said in a soft and gentle tone that he'd gotten used to since he started living with the man. Hang in there, okay? I'll take you back to camp. He had a smile on his face that was completely unlike the one he showed the class. It was the one he showed his husband at home, and the one he used on distressed civilians, 
as Suku now knew. Not that he was distressed. He was pretty happy right then. Aizawa reached for his shoulders, but the slightest jolt of a hand trying to help him was already too painful for Izuku, who jolted and gasped, sending him into a coughing fit that seemed to leave him choking on empty air. Hey, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I need you to try and stay conscious, kiddo. Can you do that for me? I know it hurts. I'm sorry. I'll be as fast as I can, okay? Tears fall from Izuku's eyes as he nods, and all he knows is he lets out a whine from the next time he's touched, and then his mind is left in empty darkness. It's dark and cold and small and scary, and he can't breathe. He can't breathe. It, it hurts. It hurts. He's choking. He's choking, and then someone is tearing at his throat, and he's choking around something, and it feels so weird, and he wants it to stop. He realizes something had been lodged in his throat only once it's gone, and he's gasping, heaving breaths as he gags and tries not to vomit on the floor. He knows he's flying, but his hands are restrained, and it's scary, and it hurts, and where is he? What are they doing to him? The next time he comes to, there's a mask over his mouth instead of a tube down his throat, which takes a major improvement of the situation. He's able to blearily open his eyes and look around. A bland, white hospital room. Or at least what he thinks would be one if he's ever been treated like one before. There's a door to his left and a window to his right. Aizawa and Yamada are both sleeping there. The former in his iconic yellow sleeping bag on the floor, the latter in a chair that somehow looks to be much less comfortable. He observes them for what could be a few seconds or a few minutes, he doesn't exactly know why he does it. He just does it, and it makes him peaceful. Safe. That's only when he realizes that something happened to leave him there. Muscular. That he possibly killed. That almost killed him. The training camp. The others. Only then does he start trying to move, although he doesn't manage much. He makes enough noise that Aizawa wakes up with a start and rushes to his side, tripping ungracefully on his sleeping bag. When Shota rushes to their child's side, he nudges his husband's knee in a thoughtless motion, just casually touching the man to wake him up, when the absence of his hearing aids kept him from noticing Izuku awakening before. Hisashi doesn't come back to awareness fully right away. He blinks slowly in the room, shrouded in darkness from the night's lack of moonlight, before looking around and finally noticing Shota by their child's side. They're awake, child's side. He jumps up almost immediately, scrambling through his pockets to try to locate what must be his hearing devices to be able to catch what's going on. By the time he's able to hear the sounds around him, he can tell that Izuku is babbling in panic about his classmates while Shota reassures him that everyone is safe, everything is fine, and Koda wasn't hurt. Well, everyone is safe now, but they weren't about to tell him that Bakugo had been kidnapped, half of both the classes spent a few days in the hospital from poison inhalation, and All Might had to retire from hero work after fighting his arch-nemesis on live television. Yeah, he definitely didn't need to know that right away. By the time he makes it to Izuku's bed, a nurse had arrived and is already bustling around, turning on the lights and asking the kid how he's feeling, helping him sit up and checking his vitals. He refuses pain meds, and Hisashi wonders how, considering how badly his chest had been broken. It had only been a week. Sure, quirks helped, but not that much. He furrows his eyebrows and decides to keep an eye on it. He just hoped that he didn't have a second Shota on his hands, trying to break out of hospitals the moment that he woke up even though 80% of his body was wrapped up in bandages and the two of his four limbs were in casts. Izuku seems coherent enough, although a bit woozy, which isn't unexpected from someone who'd been in a coma for a few days and just woke up. He doesn't even know if the kid realizes it. He just casually is answering the nurse's questions, trying to keep her from calling for a doctor, because it's the middle of the night, I'll be just fine until morning, really. He loses that fight. A doctor checks him over and eventually leaves them alone. But then Izuku's eyes are drooping already. Each of them grabs one of his hands. Izashi is sitting on the side of the bed and reassuringly squeezing it. The kid clearly wants to let go and get some sleep some more, but he's fighting it. Eventually he manages to get out what's really bothering him. Everyone's okay? He asks in a low tone. Yeah, kiddo. Shota answers him for the umpteenth time. Everyone's okay. Really. Izuku still doesn't let go of consciousness. You too? He asks, much less confidently. It's aimed at Shota, but at Hazashi too, as the glance his way lets him know, even though he wasn't even present at the attack. Did he look that bad? He'd even gone back to their place to shower and change a couple times. 
It's him that answers this time with another squeeze of their thoughtful, wonderful child. Yeah, kid, we'll be as soon as you are. Izuku's finally relaxing, but he lets out a... That's a lot of pressure. That may or may not have been meant to be said out loud, but he's drifting off already again. They watch him until he stops stirring entirely and his heart rate is perfectly regular before moving. Hisashi kisses his forehead while Shota brings one of the kid's hands to his own, holding it tightly. If he were a believer, you could almost think that he was praying to God, thanking him for letting his child live. As it was, it was simply days of worry seeping out of him, all at once. Shota had a hard time relaxing normally, but then he lost what seemed like a lifetime worth of concern weighing down on him all at once. He could finally breathe again. It took surprisingly little time for Izuku to get better after that. A few doctor's visits later, some of his friends dropped by, inevitably catching him up on everything that had happened, which earned both Hisashi and Shota a glare for the half-deception. He might resent and even hate Bakugo for how he'd treated him his entire life, but he didn't deserve to be kidnapped by villains, either. It was good he was safe now. He had a hard time wrapping his head around All Might's retirement, however. He had broken Izuku's heart that day on the rooftop, running away only seconds after breaking a child's only tether to life that he really had. He was a good hero, a great hero, just not his any longer. In the end, he'd proven him wrong, being accepted into the number one hero school in the nation, holding his own in class and emergency situations alike. Well, not without injury, but still. You couldn't hold it against him when he's the teenager facing an S-class villain on his own without support. It was a miracle he'd even survived already. Soon enough, he was ready to leave, and with his parents, guardians, carrying all of his stuff, like his arms had been broken too, he was left to walk unimpeded out of the hospital. At home, he was coddled, which made him roll his eyes as much as it warmed his heart. It was so much easier to let himself be loved now. It was nice, and although he was still embarrassed and uncomfortable, he'd hate for it to stop now. He'd gotten greedy, getting used to things that he'd never known. The streets seemed like a horrible and dreary place now that he looked back on it. He didn't want to go back. Please, don't let him go back. He had parents now. He wanted to keep them. Please. All right, everyone, this concludes To Rescue You. This was Fix 6 in the To Find a Home series. Right now, there's only six parts to this so it's concluded at this point. If the author ever comes back and adds any more, I'll gladly update this one. But still, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And as always, thank you so much for listening.